What is GDPR? And more importantly, how does it impact you and your company? Join internationally known data privacy, data protection expert, Jonathan Armstrong and Tom Fox, the compliance evangelist to learn more about the burgeoning world of data privacy and data protection. After listening to this episode, you'll walk away with a greater understanding of what this means for you and your organization. Life with GDPR is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network. Over the next three podcasts, Jonathan Armstrong and I will be looking at some post-Brexit issues, including data protection, data privacy and data transfer, and sanctions, AML, and export control. In this episode, we take up the issue of data transfer under GDPR after Brexit. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox back again with Jonathan Armstrong from Quartery Compliance in an undisclosed location near London um, (laughs) for another episode of Life with GDPR. Over this uh, short series, we're exploring issues relating to Brexit. And today we're going to take up data transfer after Brexit. So, Jonathan, first of all, welcome back. Thanks very much, Tom. So uh, this, I think, is on the foremost minds of many U.S., uh, data privacy and data compliance practitioners. So could I just maybe start with you walking us through what's the impact on data transfers first from uh, the United Kingdom to the EU, and then we'll move from the EU to the United Kingdom? Yeah, so um, uh, as we said in the last podcast, the situation until the end of April should be relatively clear and relatively stable. And it might be after April when things get a bit more complex. But as we sit here now, transferring data from the UK to the EU should be okay because of this temporary data deal. Transferring data from the EU to the UK should be okay because of the temporary data deal. And transferring data to the UK to other countries like the US is sort of okay if you put in place standard contractual clauses. And you can use the same format for standard contractual clauses as you do for EU to US transfers. And obviously, safe harbor doesn't exist because that was knocked down by the uh, ECJ. And there is no current plan for the UK to put a new safe harbor, privacy shield, whatever you want to call it, scheme in place. But that might come. Just today, for example, we found out that the UK is advertising for a new official who will sit within uh, the Department for Culture, Media and Sport to try and look at the adequacy, presumably, of the U.S., of the EU, and other countries in terms of uh, these data adequacy decisions that, that, that previously the EU had entered into on behalf of all EU member states. So there could be some sort of new privacy shield for the U.S. on the agenda. Binding corporate rules will still be respected by the U.K. data protection regulator, But for most corporations, standing contractual clauses are going to be the answer. There will be a little more complexity with that for two reasons. Firstly, the Schrems 3 decision has made it clear that you have to do this double due diligence test. So check who you're sending data to, check where that person is located and their country's laws. And then secondly, there are going to be some changes to the standard contractual clauses that are coming down the pike maybe as early as next month. So people are going to have to monitor those changes as well. We have talked about standard contractual clauses in previous episodes of this podcast series. Is that a message that you find is resonating with uh, either your clients or potential clients when you talk to them about uh, not not even interim solutions, but just solutions that corporations and data protection officers understand the need for those and are are willing to work to craft those? Yeah, I I think you're right. I mean, obviously, as as we've said, privacy shields slash safe harbor isn't uh, isn't a solution that's available. And even if there's a new scheme, I think it's subject to challenge. Uh, 
And binding corporate rules isn't a short-term solution. It's going to take you about a year to put a BCR scheme in place from start to finish. So standard contractual clauses are sort of the only game in town. I think some of our clients are doing some interesting stuff uh, with our help in looking at how you can add some process behind that double due diligence test. Uh, some people have got a very manual solution, uh, which obviously is uh, requiring resources. There are, as we've said on these podcasts before, some challenges in Germany, for example, where um, people are being asked to, to justify what their method of data transfer is, as regulatory activity as well in places like France. So it is an issue that people have to address. But I think in the short and medium term, it's quite a bespoke solution for a lot of organizations to find a way of fitting into their existing due diligence processes, whether that be financial, whether that be information security, et cetera. Jonathan, what do you assess the chances of a data transfer from the EU to the United Kingdom being challenged uh, in this period? The chances of a challenge by the end of April, I don't think are super high because I think it would be difficult to get court time. I think that if the EU does decide to grant an adequacy decision to the UK, I am fairly sure that that will be challenged. Uh, Max Schrems has said that probably isn't going to be him, but I think there are other candidates that might be Digital Rights Ireland, that might be Le Quadratudi Net, pressure groups who have shown that data transfer is something that they're interested in. I think that there is opposition in the European Parliament as well. Don't forget that some MEPs believe that the UK security services uh, spied on them. Whether they are right or wrong, that's a belief that they hold, and that is uh, uh, something that counts against the UK. Of course, the parliamentarians don't have the final say on whether the UK gets an adequacy decision or not, but they will want to have their voices heard. And at the same time, there are potential challenges from regulators, whether that be through the EDPB, European Data Protection Board, who will be consulted on this, or whether that be through individual regulators. I could probably think of names of regulators in Germany, for example, who might fancy making some sort of challenge or, or public statement. So I think it's not going to be like the yellow brick road uh, with sunny uplands ahead. I think at, at, at best it's going to be you know, a, a dirt track in a Western movie. And I don't see that changing anytime soon. I think there's there's potential for ambush. There's potential for uh, all those trials and tribulations that you would have had on the on the prairie trail along the way. Perhaps a better analogy is it will be a horse of a different color. <laughs> that might well be right. <laughs> But it might end up being a camel. Ah, unfortunately, we're <laughs> near the end of our time for this episode, but I hope our listeners will join us for our next episode in our continuing series of uh, Life After Brexit, where we take up uh, sanctions, AML, and export control. Jonathan, I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you, Tom. This is Tom Fox again. I'd like to thank you for listening to this episode with Jonathan Armstrong on Life with GDPR. You can reach Jonathan at Cordery Compliance in London. You can email me at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. Check out the show notes for more information on the KBR decision from the Cordery uh, website and for information on GDPR compliance generally. I hope you will join us again for another episode as Jonathan and I start a three-part series on some early significant uh, enforcement actions and information regarding GDPR. Thanks so much for listening.